the way we run design thinking here, we use the Stanford, uh, what they call the D school or design school model. And it's, um, it's, a, it's similar to what you have. I've just been looking over uh, briefly the website that, that Jan uh, shared with me, the Google site. Uh, and um, there are some differences which you will see as you um, go through my slides with me. And um, part of the reason we teach it here is partly we've come to learn it through osmosis, through people who have been at Stanford. Uh, myself, I've gone and visited them for a few, uh, few lectures and realized that the way they run, how they run things, there's a certain um, organic nature to it. And, um, uh, and so I hope to present some of that, that feeling to you today. So it's not just a, a presentation, but really a, a, a why. Why do we do it this way? And, and that's really what design thinking is trying to get at. It's trying to get at the whys, why things happen, how can we design things to, uh, to be better. Um, so first of all, can you hear me clearly enough? Is that is the okay? Good. So um, so uh, my background, I actually was uh, trained as an engineer, and I, um, um, I I became various things. I became an economist. Well, I was trained as an economist, and then eventually I got a, a doctorate in uh, public policy with with some environmental policy specialists. Myself, I, I came to design thinking because I was doing a lot of qualitative research and um, I was actually interested in studying game design and uh, so I've been studying that for many years and this area of design thinking started to come up in business schools but as I'll show you it has a, it has a history uh, from design professions and design schools but when it entered business schools and I'll explain why business schools are interested in it we um, we started to to wonder about the theory of it. So I started to investigate how can I help theorize better, understand this better, and even in relation to my own field work on on how games are developed. Um, so so that's how I came to it, and uh, it's been an exciting time. I, I think there's a lot of potential for it. Uh, it's, it's very popular in Singapore. The government uses it quite a bit and, and a lot of private firms are using it. Um, the, the way we teach it here, we have uh, clients. So every class will have one or two uh, clients that provide project um, opportunities for us to go in and solve problems for them. Um, that's why when I looked at the list of your projects, I was a little bit uh, overwhelmed because it's almost like every one of you has a different project in mind. Uh, and design is best done in teams, so if you uh, have a means of collapsing into teams of, uh, I don't know, three or four, I think uh, there will be a way of uh, um, being able to uh, get the best out of your group. Um, but, of course, you may have other ways of running it, so it, it's entirely up to you. I'll, I'll explain to you how we do it. So, um, so today I'm going to um, go through this outline. And uh, I'll start with um, just a, well, I've already gone through the introduction. I'll start with why design thinking, uh, talk a bit about uh, what is design thinking and its uh, characteristics. And uh, then I'll go into the method and, and step you through the process that we used. So as I mentioned before, this process comes from Stanford and uh, they've just adapted other designers' techniques, but they've made it a very short and sweet method, which sometimes yields um, good results, but more often it's, it's, it's a good opportunity to learn the process in a, in a very tight and, and quick fashion, uh, quick turnaround. You, you can um, you know, go through the steps quickly. And so I'll give you some examples of each of those phases or, or steps, as I call them and then end with some of our, our learnings. Uh, um, so why design thinking? Well, it, as I mentioned, business schools are starting to get interested in it because uh, companies are starting to get interested in it. I, I've been tracking uh, various companies and it's amazing to me uh, to read uh, how a lot of consulting firms, a lot of big companies, especially software companies, 
uh, and, and some consumer goods companies are trying to embrace design. Um, so here's an example of an article from the New York Times uh, talking about IBM, uh, which is trying to reinvent itself uh, by hiring um, so many designers, but more importantly, training uh, a lot of its middle management uh, in design thinking. Uh, you can find some of these uh, links online, and in some of the, in the slides I supply to you, you'll see some links at the back to some of these videos, and um, you can understand better what uh, what other companies do with it and how they solve problems with it. Um, one well-known designer actually uh, coined the term uh, "wicked problems," and by that he meant design was sort of suited for solving very complex problems such as social problems. Um, I think um, the evidence still needs to be borne out that that is the best tool, but it's probably uh, not a bad tool. Um, and it helps you cut through a lot of the complexity and understand what's important, uh, how to center solutions on, on people's needs. Uh, and that, that's really what modern design is about, is keeping close to uh, uh, human needs. And, and I'll show you in the process how we go through this. Um, another thing I might mention is that uh, a lot of these uh, companies that uh, are facing challenges, they, there's sort of a notion that their world, uh, their markets, their, um, their business opportunities are being disrupted by new technologies, by new startups embracing these technologies. So I think that's why a lot of these companies are uh, going towards uh, design as a way of breaking free of who they are and, and where they come from. Uh, so some of these startups uh, you no doubt have heard of, like um, Uber, uh, which is disrupting the, the transportation market. Uh, Airbnb, which many of us have stayed at, has disrupted the rental market. Um, so a lot of them start with technology, but what's interesting is that uh, they've changed our way of organizing how we as individuals and even as businesses uh, organize ourselves is different partly by using this technology but really it's about ourselves how, how have we come to embrace these new um, solutions right I mean before Airbnb none of us would have imagined renting out a room in our house and and now suddenly it's okay to do that it, it's it's thought of as not just a business opportunity but a uh, a networking and potentially a friendship opportunity. So, so that's how the meaning of things change uh, with design, and design uh, can allow us to uh, create these new meanings. Um, and uh, in Asia, uh, Europe, there's a lot of uh, changes as well. Um, the aging population is a big one that's uh, hitting Singapore, uh, China, Japan. Uh, they're all facing it, and um, there's a lot of solutions to these things. Um, and design is just one of them, but I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting methodology to, to try out. Okay, so I'm going to uh, turn now to... Um, uh, well, first I'm going to explain how innovation took place in the past. Uh, past models of innovation um, were based on um, basically uh, corporations doing R&D, research and development, in their labs. Uh, often they did the scientific basis first and then they would push that out of the lab and then they'll work with it in a kind of applied research moving it towards a product. So all the time is moving towards a technology product with certain features, certain functionalities and the engineers were the main people in, in, involved in that, the scientists as well earlier on. But nowadays we're talking a lot about services. Um, so for instance, uh, Airbnb is a service, right? Um, Uber well, it's also a service using the same transportation mode. Um, some of these are moving towards experiences uh, where they want to deliver to the consumer um, an enjoyable experience. So they're buying not just a service, but something they, they consume and, and you know, is aesthetically pleasing. And, and some of these businesses are using uh, different ways of uh, forming themselves, what we call different business models um, to get to these consumers to deliver a, a value proposition to them. So a, a few of the terms I use are um, a little bit buzzwords that we use in business schools. And if you're not uh, sure about the terms, uh, feel free to ask me afterwards. 
I'm, a, I'm afraid um, it's easier for me to lecture um, straight through uh, because I, I don't know how to take questions in this mode of delivery. I may not be able to hear so easily. So it might be better to save up the questions uh, un unless something really bad is happening on the other end. Um, so anyway, uh, getting back to what design thinking has been used for, uh, I think people embrace it as a, as a method of innovating. When we, when we taught innovation before in business schools, we kind of taught a very stage-by-stage -stage process that mimics this process of getting something out of the lab into um, the market and, and commercial production. And a lot of it was geared towards manufacturing production. So, so that, that involved a certain kind of mentality, which I'll, I'll describe later, as a kind of division of labor. It was always geared towards mass production. And design has come about when we are now trying to deliver very customized uh, products and services and experiences. And some designers actually think of themselves as reintroducing creativity into the business. Uh, and then as I mentioned earlier, and we'll talk about later, design is also helping uh, these designers or engineers or whoever is practicing it to center it on the human, the humans and their needs, on the users and their needs. And a lot of the Stanford techniques come from IDEO because um, the founder of the Stanford D School was the, one of the co-founders of, of the IDEO and his, his, bro his brother uh, was the head of IDEO at that, at that time. Tim Brown took over the leadership later. Uh, so he describes design as trying to uh, solve these three uh, objectives. Uh, one is the, 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 the user's need, and that's what he calls desirability. Uh, the second is to make sure the company making the design or the organization can implement it, uh, that the techniques are there, it, it's feasible, I mean, it's um, viable, is what he calls it. And feasibility really refers to, you know, can we afford to, to do this? Can we afford to provide this? Now, we also teach business modeling in, in the business school because we also feel that companies can adjust their business models so that something that's not feasible using their, their way of providing products and services usually can actually be reconstructed uh, to provide, provide it in a, uh, in a cheaper fashion or a different fashion. So, so really, design is about um, providing more creative and user-centered solutions that try to uh, objectives. So I was explaining uh, where design methods came from uh, traditionally. Uh, were uh, They came from schools of product design, uh, architectural schools, and some parts of design were practiced uh, in schools of computing where they focus on the user interface, uh, as well as uh, schools that taught graphic design. Uh, many of these schools actually uh, came from an arts tradition, an industrial arts tradition. So design has this craft and arts feeling to it. And, and of course, uh, engineers make a lot of technologies now that em embody design in them, and engineers have their own uh, design um, methods, uh, which tend to de-emphasize the artistic side of it. Um, and uh, now they're trying to re-embrace this design thinking in some engineering schools. So I, I, I also teach at a new university in Singapore called the um, Singapore University of Technology and Design, where they really try to emphasize the design as well as the technology. It's, it's really an engineering degree, but um, and what I found is that engineers uh, cannot help but to uh, bring their... Uh, the engineering side in first. And so the design side is kind of, uh, it's there, but it's not driving things. So design can actually be a driver, or it can actually be a, a supplementer. And, and I think uh, if you practice design thinking, it, it really is more of a driver. Um, so, uh, so let me talk a bit about uh, some of the characteristics of design. Uh, so this uh, set of slides comes from Stanford. Uh, they emphasized uh, several things. I'm, I'm going to focus on only a few of them. Uh, they talk about the human-centered nature of design. Uh, they talk about being mindful of the process, like as you go through this process of understanding users and uh, having ideas and prototyping um, 
just be mindful which step is, is leading to the next, uh, which next step. Uh, they, they talk a lot about action, um, as I'll explain to you later. Uh, but the, I'll actually explain the action as uh, the um, really uh, prototyping, uh, t uh, taking action to prototype something. And then they talk about collaboration. Bringing, and so at Stanford, a lot of the design teams are, are uh, from across the university. They'll, they'll, they will not have a, a whole team of engineers. They'll have a, an engineer, maybe a business student, and maybe someone from social science or education uh, or, or whatever. So, um, so I'll go through each of these uh, in turn. And just this morning, I, I sat down and, and looked through these and tried to think about whether there was a, a true th a theoretical basis for each of these aspects of design, and I could find some aspects underlying each one. So I'm, I'm a little more comfortable now that, that these are not just grabbed out of thin air, um, but they actually have some basis and some, uh, in some intellectual roots in, in the historical design traditions. So, so the human-centered part, um, uh, this is really about uh, trying to understand the user's needs and wants uh, as expressed in emotionally and expressed when we interview users. We try to uh, extract what it really means to them, uh, how, they would, how they use verbs and, and adjectives to describe uh, the problems they face and, and, their, and their desires, uh, wants and desires. So this example comes from IDEO that was consulting with uh, a very large health maintenance organization in California called uh, Kaiser Permanente. They have millions of patients, I think, and uh, it's the largest uh, HMO in the US. So they run hospitals, they run doctor's clinics, they, they have a whole complex and network of such things. And they thought that they had to optimize, they had to um, either build more facilities because the facilities were full of people who are unhappy and so on and so forth. And when I, I do went and studied and interviewed these patients and their family, and they realized certain things were going on. So the exact words they used were that these people were becoming annoyed even before they saw the doctor uh, because of the process. The process was, not del was delivering a very unpleasant experience. Uh, the checking in process was a nightmare. Uh, waiting rooms, uncomfortable. I'm sure all of us have been in medical facilities like that. So, uh, so on top of that, right, they, they studied people when they started to separate and the patients would go see the doctors and, and other people were left alone and both sides were unhappy. The people seeing the, the doctors hated the, the rooms they were in, the people left alone uh, felt anxious and, and worried. So they realized that actually the patient experience was, was the problem. So, so what they did is instead of building uh, more facilities, uh, they actually redesigned the waiting facilities and, and the waiting experience to take people's minds off, off of um, their immediate uh, worries. Um, now, if this uh, doesn't resonate with you, just um, think about when you've visited uh, one of these um, theme parks, especially if you've gone to a very crowded theme park like Disneyland or Universal Studios, um, you might have noticed that the lines aren't any shorter these days. There's still like one hour or more to queue to get into the, the most popular attractions. But you don't notice the queue as much in some of these attractions because they build the whole experience into the queue. It's actually the queue is an experience already. So you have a lot of TV screens showing you the, the building up of the story and it immerses you in it. So that's sort of taking your mind away from things. And, and that's the, again, uh, it's a very design sort of uh, thinking to do that. All right. Um, another thing that design is uh, well known for, well, actually, it's, uh, it's about the process. The process has uh, a few facets uh, to it. One is this idea that you're, you're going back and forth between the, the, what is what you conceive of as the problem and what you conceive of as the solution to that problem. And so you might start over here with a, a, a small problem and then you try to design a solution to it and, and the patient or whoever might still be unhappy and you discover through their unhappiness actually there really was another underlying problem. You go back here, you try to solve it uh, and then you still feel that it's not 
they, they still feel that it's not very uh, satisfactory. And eventually you find what's really a big, the biggest problem uh, to them. And you may still iterate on solutions until you find that the, the most popular solution to them. So this is what we describe as the co-evolution, uh, the going back and forth between the problem space and the solution space. And this is actually um, very classical of design work, uh, and it creates a lot of uncertainty, which makes students a bit worried because they think, oh, we don't know really, we don't feel like we're finding the, the problem yet. Uh, you may not find the problem till two, three term, but when you do find it, there's this kind of aha moment, uh, partly because it did take you three, four weeks to find it. So, so that's getting comfortable with that uncertainty is, uh, is, is one of the things we, we try to stress to students. Um, another aspect of the problem is that you're sometimes diverging, you're accommodating more information either because you're gathering more information or you're having more ideas or you're converging, you're selecting one idea, the prototype, or you're defining, taking all that information and analyzing and, and making it compact so that you get one clear design uh, principle or the, a problem statement out of it. I'll describe this uh, further, but just be aware that you're, you're utilizing different uh, faculties, different uh, parts of your mind. So the diverging part is where you really have to be creative and free-flowing and not critical of each other and uh, or very open-minded, looking for problems, understanding people's needs. Uh, so there's different kinds of divergence, right? The information collection phase and the idea, uh, the ideation or idea generating phase. And then there's different kinds of diverging. But th that's essentially what um, uh, we, another way we characterize the process by. Uh, a third aspect of design is uh, being tangible. Uh, so being tangible, in this case, uh, involves having actual prototypes, actual s simple uh, um, methods that we use to construct uh, uh, artifacts that, that we can present to people to get their reaction. So IDEO is very proud of this particular prototype because they were um, working with surgeons and the surgeon said, I need a tool uh, that feels like this or, or can be gripped like this. And the ideal designer whipped up this prototype in, on the left-hand side uh, very quickly, right? Just using a close peg, a marker, and a film canister. And when the surgeon felt it, he said, oh, that's right. That's, that's what I'm talking about. And this is the final production uh, model, this uh, what, the one on the right. Now, it, it seems rather simple, but um, I, I think what it conveys is the little things matter, right? Like anyone can present a surgeon with a, a, a toy water pistol and say, is that what you want? But it's the shape of the pistol that matters because this surgeon is going to sit there for three hours with this thing inside your body and they probably need a lot of comfort from the posture. So I think there's a lot of ergonomics that will just manage to get embedded into this prototype. Okay. And um, so the, the, one of the last aspects is, is collaboration. As I mentioned before, it's about collaborative teams. Uh, I put up this slide because I always like to start my lectures with some industrial history. And, and this is the old Ford Motor um, Company uh, production line for the Model T, one of the very first mass-produced cars. And, and Henry Ford was known for telling people, you may have heard, uh, you can have any car you like as long as it's black in color. So he's basically telling you you have no choice. Um, and, uh, and that's really because there was a division of labor. The, the, the person who was supposed to paint the cars basically just had to slap one coat of paint on every car. And, and so this division of labor involves uh, specialization. Everybody does one job really well. And in this modern age, we don't think that way because not everything is about mass production. We, we all want customized goods and experiences, uh, and, ex and experiences sometimes are not mass produced, right? So the, uh, the designers have to think much, put a lot more effort and, and creativity into the beginning uh, when they're thinking, how do we deliver something that people will consume in different ways? Uh, because through digital uh, uh, the technologies, for instance, these, this content can, can be uh, changed or users can even customize it themselves. So the thinking is different and organization therefore has to be different. 
So that's one reason why um, they always emphasize uh, teams of people with different uh, disciplinary backgrounds, but even different mentalities. Like someone could be very creative, someone could be very analytical, and by pairing them together, uh, presuming that they get along, uh, they will balance each other and, and be able to lend their strengths. So this will lead to more novelty. It will also lead to a reduction in bias because one person is not driving uh, something all the time. I've had student teams where if one person is driving everything and, and you walk up there and you realize it, everyone's being quiet, you have to find a way to balance it out uh, because then the team effect will take over. And all these studies that we have from organizational behavior showing that diversity really improves team performance, only then will those studies truly be seen that, that having a diverse team will actually uh, work. So just to um, summarize, uh, design thinking is, is about these, uh, these four things. Being human-centered on, on users' needs and wants uh, is an iterative process. Um, and uh, it's about being more tangible, prototyping, um, uh, and, and so on, and it's about collaboration. But now I'm actually going to mention uh, an extra thing, uh, which is I, I think design thinking is also about um, attitudes. Now uh, you might ask yourselves, uh, you know, what's what's the attitude here in this in this picture? Um, these are all business people, unless everyone dresses like this in certain countries. Uh, but they're all playing with Lego. And, and Lego, well, I have given Lego to my, my, my students, my working students before, and their first reaction is often, oh, my children play with that. So they can't get past that barrier. But what happens when you start focusing on the Lego and you start ignoring the fact that you're playing with your children's toys, that you're, you're working with your children's toys? You're starting to f solve problems. You're starting to to move the pieces around and, and to explore different possibilities. And, and that's a sort of playful attitude. So, so I think design thinking is about trying to break down some boundaries and have available the, the objects, uh, the artifacts to help you uh, think. Think with your hands, think with your minds, think of possibilities. And that's the creative part of design. So in fact, um, just uh, uh, next, uh, Next week, uh, I'm going to be at SUTD, and we're going to be running a, a prototyping workshop. And I'll actually be, um, uh, we're going to be using Lego. Uh, you probably can't see it if I put it on the screen right now, but we're going to try to uh, get expert uh, views, expert users, uh, to think about uh, users on new technology in a medical setting, setting like so. using Lego, and, and, and as well as other well prototyping well materials. materials. So now I'm going to talk about the different phases of the design method. Okay, so uh, so these are the, what sometimes I call them the steps or the phases. Hmm. Now that I've moved it, I did something. Okay, so the starting point is the design brief. Uh, uh, traditionally, if you're working in a commercial setting, or when I'm working with my corporate clients, I mean, they're, I call them clients, but they're really providing a project for the class to test our, our minds on. Um, uh, we, we try to identify a, 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 the broader scope of design problem. And, and so this example explains to you better uh, what, what it's a, a design brief is about. Uh, traditionally, we are very solution driven. We, we kind of know the space of solutions, like a, a consumer goods company like Procter and, ja Procter and Gamble would tell um, whoever it is, probably they are scientists, we want a better detergent to clean a house by. Uh, whereas with design, when Procter & Gamble actually, um, uh, when they uh, um, employed a, a design firm called Continuum, uh, they, they worked with a brief that was described as, how do we design a better cleaning experience? So basically that allows different kinds of problems within it and different kinds of solutions. And so uh, Continuum went and, and did some ethnography. They went and studied how people clean in their homes uh, without intruding into that, that whole uh, experience. And, and they observed that users actually spend a lot of time getting the dust off the floor. 
Now, they, they had to take out a big vacuum cleaner from the cupboard, you know, connect it, and, and use a lot of strength and push it around. Then they had to take it to another room and plug it, drag the whole thing over, and plug it in again, and then clean again. And that didn't seem like a very pleasant experience. So, uh, so they took that insight and probably other things, and they worked with it to uh, formulate a solution where they realized that what users really wanted was a light uh, and efficient cleaning experience, even inexpensive. And so they came up with this thing. I don't know whether you can see it when I show it on screen. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah. This is, uh, these are the cleaning wipes. We use them a lot in Singapore. These are the Japanese variety, and 3M has them. But P&G, when, when Continuum came up with this, create a billion dollar business out of these wipes. So they discovered using electrostatic, electrostatic energy would attract the dust. All they had to do is attach a very light uh, broom handle to this and they could easily collect dust. So, um, so that, that's an example of a, a design solution that didn't yield specifically a, a technology but yielded uh, something that, that solved uh, the problem in, a problem in different ways. Um, now I'm going to go through the Stanford process. So presuming we had a brief from the client and we may have to go back and forth with the client on, on these briefs uh, because sometimes they don't know what a brief is, sometimes we also don't know what the correct brief is because sizing it, scoping it is kind of important. Um, we come down to, and some of your research topics actually do sound like briefs already, so that's nice. Uh, so we come down to starting the process off. <laughs> Uh, so the process is defined as these five steps uh, emph to emphasize, sorry, empathize, uh, to define. Uh, so e to empathize is, is to understand users' needs and, des and uh, desires um, and, and the causes for these. Uh, to define is to basically get a, a nice clean problem statement uh, about what uh, a user's need, probably the most important need is and how to, um, uh, how to frame it so that you can have many solutions to it. Then you take that problem statement and you, you brainstorm. You have these so many solutions. You select one of the type and each time you prototype, you test it with users and you, you try to find out more needs, right? You get deeper into their reactions to this technology. And so you're really learning about both the problem space better and, and even the solution space, which parts of the solution space work or don't work. And, uh, and it's very, they call it uh, nonlinear, meaning you can, you, you start off, we, for educational or pedagogical purpose, we, we move from the left to the right, but in reality, you can move back and forth at some point. Probably after the em empathize, empathize stage, uh, you can start moving a little bit, try out an idea, if you don't like it, move back. But uh, for, for those starting out, we usually step through the process. Now, what we normally do in our classes is we will run this um, three times. Uh, not always the same process, but we'll, we'll do a one day, uh, actually a, a one or two hour uh, design exercise which covers the entire process uh, using just uh, two students at a time. And this is online at Stanford. It's called the design a wallet or design a gift giving experience. I, I can share that link and, and um, uh, the professor and, and whoever else, you, you guys can facilitate it yourselves, uh, even watching their video. Uh, so that w will crystallize a lot of what I'm trying to talk about here. Um, then we'll, what I normally do is, is uh, I'll run a, a, a kind of a, a fake experience, like design a uh, a better cafe experience or design a better shopping experience and I'll send the students out and we'll run through uh, these steps over a, a three session period. Um, so maybe over nine hours of, of three classes we'll, we'll be doing this uh, lecturing as well as going out and gathering data, um, having ideas and then prototyping. And then finally we, we run at, in parallel, we'll run the, the actual class project. So that way you're learning the techniques, you're not making uh, mistakes on the class project near the end, uh, although you're, you should be making mistakes in the class project anyway. 
uh, but this will help you learn faster by by uh, condensing it. So so that's what. So this also explains. Uh, this slide explains the, the different techniques and, and tools that we use at each of these phases. Uh, so I'll, I'll describe uh, interviews and ethnography shortly. Uh, then I'll describe uh, defining a point of view. Uh, there'll be another slide describing alternatives, such as coming up with design principles. Uh, but it's a bit too complicated to get into the alternatives. Even when I toss it to my students in a regular class, they get confused between the terminology. Uh, but this is just to show to you that there are different design uh, processes, different design terms, and slightly different um, um, activities that those terms uh, involve. And then there are different brainstorming methods where we all adopt a, a, a simple brainstorming exercise, uh, which I'll show you. And then there's different prototypes, different types of prototypes, which I'll show you as well, if I have time. Um, Let's see, it's about halfway through, right? Okay, so the emphasize stage, emphasize, sorry, I keep mispronouncing that, is um, basically uh, these two techniques. I, I teach these two techniques. If you run the one, the one hour uh, Stanford uh, designer wallet exercise, you'll get uh, lots of interview practice. And um, uh, what we do is... Uh, what we're trying to do with both these techniques is, is understand what the user's needs and and um, really deep down what's driving them. What 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 are their pains and and uh, why why can't they achieve those um, goals that they have? So there are different kinds of users. Uh, the Stanford approach tends to uh, uh, predicate uh, the what we they call extreme users, or I call lead users. So these are users that are more willing to try out something first before anybody else, and they might be highlighting something new, some kind of new insights uh, to a market or a market opportunity, uh, because California is like that, right? Uh, San Francisco area, there's a lot of uh, people who, who like new technology and trying things out and experimenting. Uh, on the other hand, there's also uh, what we call ordinary users in unusual situations. So this is, for instance, um, like the design firm studying how people clean their homes. They go into ordinary people's homes and study how, how they clean, and then they try to gain insights into uh, what are the problems in everyday cleaning experiences. Uh, sometimes uh, people are confronted with something that's not quite fitted. So the vacuum cleaner uh, was not quite fitted to cleaning dust, right? It's meant for probably cleaning carpets. Um, and uh, um, children who are using adults utensils, right? You can see them struggling, and so uh, from there you can you can figure out what really would suit children better based on their having to use adult uh, adult adult implements. Um, that's a that's a is is easy for some students to want to you know use their classmates or use themselves. Uh, as experiments in, in these situations, but we sometimes uh, steer them to working with real users because uh, nothing beats a, a real person, especially when it comes to giving validated feedback. Um, and um, and so, so the goal of all this uh, uh, qualitative research uh, is to develop insights, uh, deep insights, uh, which you normally don't get from things like surveys or, or focus groups. Uh, they, they tend to gather different kinds of information. They tend not to... Uh, when, when you design a survey, you're basically, you roughly know what people want already, and you're asking them from this list of five choices, what, what do you like? And you're not asking them, why do you like this? So, so that's where the interview techniques are important, is to probe deeper, um, you know, what's in their mind. Um, these insights sometimes don't come while you're collecting the data, so you will have to gather the data and reflect on it, as I'll show you later. Uh, there are other things that you might be aware of. Uh, say, for instance, I send students into a cafe. If I really care about their designing the, the right solution, I would say, you know, go to different cafes, uh, see what's different across them. Even the users are maybe different. Or go at different times of the day, right? So, so these are ways you, you space out your data collection uh, so that you actually... Uh, uh, understand uh, differences across uh, 
uh, types of people. Um, or you may follow a single user from their home on their journey and you discover maybe their problem started at home. Their problem didn't start uh, when they were at work, right? Maybe they didn't drink enough coffee or something and so they're sleepy at work. Um, maybe they didn't sleep well. You know, these are all things that only when you study people qualitatively, you, you get an understanding of what's really under, the underlying causes are. So this is an example of a... a I use this example for observation because this is an actual um, uh, experimental scientist in India, Dr. Sugitra, uh, Sugut, Sugutra Mitra, I think. Um, so this is a TED talk, actually. And he, um, he, he just um, dug holes in a wall of his computer company's compound and stuck computers out into the streets near, next door and and he just wanted to observe how the children react when come when they come face to face with technology they've never seen before because these are all street children they, they, they obviously have clothes they go to school but they're still very poor very poor people um, and so um, in observation what you normally study uh, is, is you're looking for the what, what's happening, and you're looking for the why's, why are they doing this, and, and probably just as important, the how, the process by which they do it. And so that reveals some of the inner um, ways in which um, people are dealing with their daily situations. So, so the what kind of is reflected as their practices, right? This is the second line here. So these are actually words I've pulled off um, other people's uh, slides. There's a Stanford computer science professor who has now moved to the University of California who had some slides online and I thought this was a very nice um, um, condensation of what he asked uh, students to look for for user interface design. Um, so, so they're looking for the practices. So the practices are, you know, in this case is, is, the, is the children, you know, how are they actually going about learning how to use computers on their own because uh, the good doctor would not ever tell them how to do it. And if they ever ask them, he says, you go figure it out. And, and then they're also looking for behaviors. How, how do they uh, work by themselves and with, with other people? And if there are any breakdowns. In this case, the breakdown is the new technology, which they don't know how to deal with. So they improvise. They, they learn to use their social behaviors and anything the computer has on screen uh, to help them learn. And he discovered certain things. He discovered that uh, these students, I mean, these children could learn how to use the computer within an hour or two. They could surf to different websites because the structure of the web uh, facilitates this kind of probing, right? Um, some of these children would eventually, in some of the other states he experimented with, they would eventually move on, get onto websites that taught them how to use other technologies in the real world. So they would be uh, filming uh, bees and butterflies using... Uh, video equipment they scared up. And so, so these are things that they just learn on their own. And it just shows the power of, of um, the technologies and, and the human mind. Now, uh, so that's just the experience of when, when you see them, of course, you, you would talk to them and say, what are you doing? Or why are you doing this? And things like that. I followed some of them around. So one of the, the, the brightest of these children, he would follow that uh, boy to his school to see how uh, they learn in school and, and of course they don't have computers at school they're sitting on the wherever uh, but then he discovered observing this boy that he's actually very uh, he's very uh, already attentive in school but the teacher said since the, con the computer came into his life he was even more enthusiastic so, so these are the kinds of things uh, this is what we might call a user journey following the user around and, and mapping their, their feelings and what they're saying and what they're thinking. Um, and, and that actually um, describes two of these tools in one, is, is taking that empathy map, what people say, do, think, and feel, and mapping it onto the different stages of the journey. Before he got to the computer or after he got to the computer, what did he do next? And so he gains little insights into these um, children's lives that way, how they learn with, with new technology. There are other frameworks um, that other designers have come up with. So uh, there's one uh, designer, his name is Kumar. He's come up with a framework called Poems. Actually, it's Kumar and I think Whitney at um, Illinois Institute of Technology. 
So there's something called the People, Objects, Environment, Services, and Messages uh, framework. Now, all these frameworks are ways for you to just remember what to keep track of, what to look for, right? You have to remember that people are not just working with a, a, a given technology, but they're working in the environment that the technology is in. Uh, sometimes that there's a service that the technology is only part of, and, and embedded in the environment are messages, right? Especially designers worry a lot about the symbols in public areas that are guiding us as we go about our, our daily business. So, so that's kind of um, useful if you're trying to think about other things besides just uh, the one product design. And, and so really each one of these is, is meant to help you structure a little bit the collecting of data on, on different aspects of user behavior. So. Um, so, so this is just an example of a, of a user journey map. Uh, you can find these things online. There's a lot of web resources. A lot of designers are very kind to post uh, frameworks for user journeys. They all have their own. Uh, what, what we try to do here is we, we try to um, map each stage by what's actually happening, what's the moment the user is in at each stage. Uh, how do you describe that stage? That's the moment. How we describe the goals the user is striving to achieve at that stage, um, and and the actions or the interactions that the user is engaged with with other people or providers of service, and then their feelings, their emotions. So that's a way of breaking down each stage. Uh, my my co-instructor here, who comes out of the Stanford D School, he likes to use this particular uh, uh, typology. So, so I have to give him credit for this one. Because I kept trying to beat it and I can't beat it or something better. Um, and then the interviews. Interviewing techniques, uh, we usually have semi-structured, meaning we start with some questions, uh, but these questions often start open-ended and, and they're very broad, like, tell me about your experience with this or what do you like about this. Then as, as we start to hear interesting uh, things coming out, we, we probe deeper. So by probing, we might ask for an example, a, a story. Um, you can employ a technique called the five whys, but in reality, it's really hard to ask why. They're trying to ask you to do is to get at the deepest reason why something is happening. Um, or you can ask around uh, the situation. Besides what happened, you can ask why it happened, how did it happen, and then how did why did this particular part of it happening happen? So that, that's sort of how you get at five whys. Um, these are, the five whys is a standard technique. Again, you'll find it on, on the web somewhere. Uh, be a good listener. Uh, don't force them into answering, oh, um, you like this, because that will um, anchor them, or get them thinking only about that one thing that you're talking about, thinking that's what you care about. Uh, so that's why we try to keep it open. Now, if we discover something that uh, that was important, like why someone goes to a cafe is because of the experience and not because of the coffee, uh, you may ask three, four, five other people later, uh, and then only after you ask them the same open-ended question and you've exhausted their reasons, you might come back and say, uh, what about the experience? How do you compare the experience to the coffee? So that way you don't anchor them early but you validate later whether or not they care about this after they've given their real answer. Um, so these are all interviewing techniques. Um, sample size, my students always want to know the sample size because they want to interview as few as possible. Uh, they're very busy students. Uh, but of course, the, the more they interview, the more the, the richer the, the data. Um, and, and saturation or, or validation, uh, when, do you, when is enough enough? Well, if you start seeing things repeating over and over, and for me, I like to think of just a number three. If I see th three interviewees giving the same answers, or if three of them, I uh, find three of them who believe this is important, uh, I feel that's enough to validate that this is a, a significant enough uh, behavior or, or reason or phenomena. Uh, because this is not statistical analysis. This is uh, qualitative analysis, and I'm just looking for a number bigger than uh, one, but that's safe to, to say, well, look, enough people actually uh, believe in this. Um, if, if only one person volunteered this thing, if it's a rare occurrence, uh, a rare phenomena, I, I'll still look at it and say, okay, maybe this person uh, has something to say. He might be a, an extreme user who only sees this need right now. 
Um, after we get all this data, we, we put it up on post-it pads, uh, or at least I ask the students to do that, and then there are different ways of, of um, sorting it. Uh, the one that's most common is, is this one on the top right hand, where we form the clusters organically around the phenomena we think the, uh, or the axis, the dimension that we think is actually operating uh, to, break up, to break up the data. Uh, and this is just a way of making sense of the data so that you can uh, think about, you know, what are the deepest insights in there. And uh, um, this is also called affinity mapping. So if you look for it uh, online, you'll, you'll find affinity maps uh, out there. And we also, when we go to ideation and brainstorming, we also break up the ideas into these clusters uh, in the same fashion or into a two by two. Uh, so that we can make sense of it and see what's the one that people care about the most, which cluster or which, uh, in this case, which quadrant, which part of the two by two. Um, so from from all that qualitative data and after the analysis, we, we hope to get at insights. The insights uh, typically take the form of, of a statement like this. Oops, uh, I'm going to have to select this. So um, uh, a user needs a way to say achieve this uh, because they want they want they have a deeper reason or but something gets in the way something like that there's a condition that that's aiding them or that, that they need to fulfill or, or that's stopping them uh, and, and these help us uh, um, create a, a design a point of what we call a point of view so in the next slide uh, the point of view is basically taking this um, this uh, insight and connecting the user, who the user is, to the need of the user, and, and that insight. So, for example, um, just this last month, we, we had a bank as a customer, and the students were out trying to invent the bank branch of the future for this bank. And so they needed to know how much of a bank can become digital and how much has to remain physical. And so when they identified specific users, they discovered that certain users like say Joe, some elderly person, needs a physical bank branch because it makes him feel safe and secure for certain kinds of transactions. So that's a kind of a point of view statement that you can now design uh, different kinds of bank facilities that would address this need. Um, and, and that's sort of, um, that's sort of the, the encapsulation of a point of view. The other things about point of views uh, that, that I'll leave here is basically uh, a way to help you design a range of solutions. Uh, you, sh you should not take a point of view as, as a of anything that's uh, fixed in stone because you may change the insight and therefore change the point of view. Uh, through later validation and prototyping, you may discover a more important problem uh, statement that, that you want to solve. Um, so that's how you go back and forth. Um, point of views may also be constructed on a composite user. You may they may have interviewed a few people that they typify as this elderly guy, Joe, or maybe he's not elderly. Maybe there's a, a type of person that just is not a digital native for various reasons. Um, and just to be aware of these. Um, um, there are other kinds of uh, problem statements, as I call it. Uh, so you may not even have a point of view. So uh, this uh, designer, Kuma, uh, he describes uh, his student, one of his student projects, uh, looking at the, the poor, the poor in ha public housing in Chicago, and so they came up with a, f a few problem statements. One of which was uh, this particular one: to raise the spirits by detoxifying, by getting rid of the poisonous emotional environment. These projects are filled with uh, broken families, drug users. So, so they describe all that as a poisonous environment and how to progress towards a healthier neighborhood. So I, now you can see a variety of solutions can come into play uh, for this kind of a problem statement. Uh, it's, bit, it's broader than a point of view because there's not a single user in there, uh, but you can still see users in there, right? The human-centered part still remains. Uh, you may need more field work to arrive at this kind of a very mature statement, though. Um, now I'm going to move to brainstorming. Uh, we uh, encourage uh, collaboration, uh, not to be critical in the brainstorming mode, have as many ideas as 
possible, even crazy ideas, what they call wild ideas. Uh, use uh, informal media like like these um, post-it pads, um, and and use markers. We we like to use markers on them because then you can't write too much on it, and people can immediately see see your ideas up on a wall when when they're all up on a wall. Uh, you can read it at one glance. Uh, I'll show you the I would show you the post-its on my on my whiteboard, but it is a total mess. I made a mess of it. Um, some of my students actually did have uh, a lot of. Um, um, this is a, um, uh, an idea of their uh, solution. They would have, have ideas on a solution that sort of follow the user eating experience. You, you can't really see it, but, but this is just to describe the flow of it. Um, and uh, then you will select an idea, uh, yeah, like maybe the most viable one, the most interesting one, and you'll vote on them, right? So that not project. Uh, and, and the ones with the highest votes, you, you take forward the prototyping. This is an example, uh, which I, I don't know if I, I probably don't have time to go through this, but I'll leave it there for you to, to read um, uh, at your leisure later. Um, but it, it's based on an actual exercise that I, I conducted for faculty when we were introducing design here. Uh, and we were trying to find out how to improve the student learning experience. And so I started with a very open question, what is your favorite class and why? And, and the student surprised me by saying, oh, ethics, which is a required class, and we, no we normally don't think of ethics as exciting, but then further probing showed that she was actually, okay, I'm already describing a slide, uh, that, that she felt safe participating, because some of our classes, uh, some guys will talk a lot, and, and some women will feel, oh, I don't feel like I can talk anymore. Uh, and she also felt good in the group project, because the project was a sort of a, uh, a debating style. Um, so we, I created this point of view, and then um, if, if you were going to have um, ideas, there are different ways to have ideas. Um, sometimes a wild idea can still be useful. Say someone says, oh, let's uh, have a class that's like uh, uh, playing King of the Hill, playing a game. Uh, but then people say, well, King of the Hill is, is competitive, right? Uh, but if you think about King of the Hill, right, uh, whoever gets to the top gets some temporary status and then another person gets a chance to get to the top and sometimes it's not always who's strongest who gets to the top. So that allows people to exchange roles and maybe that's something projects need to have. Uh, so the essence of the idea is preserved and not the game. Uh, there may be analogies. Designers love to use analogies. So if someone has an idea, a made up idea, so don't, don't assume that these come from anything important. Uh, say someone says, run a class like a fishing trip. Now, I don't know what insight would have triggered this, but uh, fishing trips are kind of like exploration. So you don't know what you're getting, and sometimes you're really excited by what you get. So how do you build in these exciting moments into a class? Um, you probably notice uh, in some classes, uh, you arrive at insights that are like aha moments uh, that an instructor has sort of um, allowed to happen. And you might think that those are ha kind of moments where you have the insight yourself uh, were accidental. Uh, I can tell you that probably a lot of instructors spend a lot of time trying to build that into the class. I, I can't do it, but <laughs> it it's hard work. Um, anyway, and then combinations, combining things together. I, I think that's a very powerful design technique, uh, which um, not enough is made of it. And, and I do a lot of that in, in my own uh, research on design because games are very much combined ideas. Um, prototyping, uh, we encourage rough prototypes. We, we often use materials uh, such as these. Can you see the materials? Yeah. Yeah. So we use Play-Doh, we use ice cream sticks. These are what they use at Stanford, actually. Uh, we use a tape, a colored paper, uh, things that allow you to make different forms, because what you want is the ability to make different kinds of forms quickly. So that you can make, you can make even uh, uh, with those materials, you can even make a, a Lego diorama. Uh, this is sort of my representation of a hospital setting that we're going to prototype uh, next week. Can you see this as well? Hi. Maybe not. Anyway, uh, I'll show it later when I have a full screen. I'm afraid to take off the <clears throat> the mini screen because I may not get back into the slides quickly enough. Um, uh, prototyping, different types of prototyping media serve different purposes. Um, 
sometimes people sketch on a piece of paper, and, and that's simply that's good enough. Uh, it, it conveys more than a thousand words. Sometimes a, a 3D prototype such as Lego allows you to move things on it so people can express what they want. And that's something you can't do with a sketch. A sketch is a sketch. What you can do with a sketch is simulate a story, right? Um, so different kinds of prototypes uh, uh, serve different purposes. And, and what I try to stress with students, types for learning. So if you're going to have two prototypes, you learn from the first one, and that makes your second one different and better. Uh, or you may prototype the same idea in two different ways and get reactions, different kinds of reactions to learn deeper uh, from, from a, a user. So this is an example of um, uh, what I just described, um, the, uh, the storyboard kind of uh, flow, like a comic book. Uh, this is an experience, a role play, where you feel what is the experience like. This is actually McDonald's University. Sorry, a lot of American examples here. Uh, this one comes from, uh, hopefully, Europe. It's a Lego prototype, like, like what we're about to, to do here in Singapore. Uh, these are an uh, example of a physical prototype using just a box. Uh, this is actually a prototype of a toy or a toy box. And, and this is an example of a paper prototype. Uh, a lot of uh, computer designers uh, user interface designers p prototype with paper the screens and the flow of the screens as you move from one screen to the next. You can get YouTube videos on this as well. And um, so uh, I w don't really have time to go into the weaknesses of the Stanford approach uh, or into the variations of design processes. Uh, but uh, what I, I noticed is some designers, when they teach design thinking, they, they will like the traditional designers from design schools will spend a lot of time in the field work, maybe two or three weeks uh, trying to understand maybe a, a complex setting. Uh, and Stanford will be focused on very simple ideas because they want to take it out to the market quickly, get a product prototype out of it. Uh, and it's partly for learning purposes they do that. So just be aware when you employ the Stanford method, it's not teaching you to solve a complex problem. Now, there's a, there's a website that's online that actually, uh, let's see, it, it actually uh, has some mini cases of design projects. I found this one particularly uh, illuminating. The website is called thisisdesignthinking.net. And this project, which is a German, uh, actually the German uh, design school, HPI, uh, did a project in Tanzania. Now, they had a single technology they were going to roll out anyway, which is solar panels. And, and so they had to figure out what, they had to have an assumption that people would want solar panels, presumably from past evidence. And the question is, how do you get more of these into people's hands? So they went in and they observed people from a, a whole bunch of observations. They had an insight for each observation. Uh, they formed a design principle, which was more as a constraint. It wasn't a problem statement, but it was a constraint because the real big problem is how do we get solar panels into these homes, right? Uh, so these design principles were basically formed from the insights and were, had to be accounted for in the solution. And then they came up with a solution, a kind of a rent-to-own concept. Uh, there was more complexity to it, but you can look at it online. So just to show you a, a very different kind of a, a somewhat different kind of design process, there was no clear point of view that I, I could see in this case. Uh, but there were these design principles that help you think about what are you designing uh, to do or, or to avoid uh, doing. And um, we have some other learnings at uh, SMU, uh, but uh, I'll go through these if, if we need to. Uh, uh, I'll some questions uh, from you uh, next. Um, I think what I'll um, just end by is, is summarizing. I'm thinking is helping us deal with complexity and uncertainty. Uh, it comes from some historical traditions, but we've adapted it to uh, services, uh, experiences, even business models. Uh, there are characteristics of the design process. Some people feel it's really about, uh, it's a process that uh, brings in creativity, uh, but it centers it on the, on the user and the user's needs. Uh, there's a process that we follow through that starts with um, understanding the user and goes to creative ideas and then prototyping solutions. And, and finally, you know, it's a process. We have to use it uh, to make sense with uh, and we have to embrace this uncertainty. Um, I'm sorry for talking so fast, but I, I hope um, you've 
been able to catch most of what I said or some of what I said. Uh, and I'll just now.